graduates about 7,000 students every year. We have about 150 degree programs. I always like to say, if you're not familiar with us, you're probably familiar with the University of Tampa. They're one of our biggest competitors. Our main campus is down in Fort Lauderdale, so we have NCAA Division II sports, Greek life, dorms, the whole works. And we are the second largest campus in our university system. On that note, I'm gonna hand it back over to Nia. And thank you all very much, and wish you a really great session. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. The campus is absolutely gorgeous. I did not know um, how, how wonderful it would be. So thank you for having us. Uh, very much appreciated. And thank you for that, um, that offer. So the next uh, presenting sponsor is going to be Amy with Career Source Pinellas. Okay, it's Melissa today. <laughs> My name is Melissa Earhart, and I am with Career Source Pinellas. And if you do not know what we do, we are here to serve employers and job seekers and make the connections. We are state funded and uh, uh, through grant funded, so everything that we do is free for you and for our. We have also uh, Chemco Systems. They're not going to be here uh, to, to present today, but they are one of our presenting sponsors, so thank you to them. And then also, uh, lastly, we have Dr. Lisa Negrini with Learning Empowered. Thank you. Even though I have a PhD, this campus makes me want to come back to school. It is gorgeous, and I know I'm going to be able to recruit some students to come here and enjoy this beautiful area. So Learning Empowered, we've been around since 1975 as UMCM, and in 2019 we changed our name to Learning Empowered because we have a little bit broader perspective. We're trying to serve families with educational needs from birth across the lifespan. I'm excited to be on this campus and the speakers we have today. So please stand and be recognized. I know some of you don't like to do that, but stand and be recognized so that we can thank you. All right. So our format this morning is pretty straightforward. We've got three panelists. Each are going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to do a Q&A. Change and leadership from the University of Southern California, Rosser School of Education. His innovation-focused research was dominated, uh, excuse me, nominated for a USC Dissertation of Distinction Award. Dr. Hawks received a certificate in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace from University of South Florida, Muma College of Business. So please welcome Dr. Hawks. Thank you. If you have a chief technology officer and you have a chief marketing officer, who's your chief diversity and inclusion officer? Because it can't just get buried under HR. It can't get buried under operations. There should be a focus for the organization. And if it's not, that's not putting the priority of that test that we talked about at the forefront. And then last, both of these are not a destination. Diversity and inclusion is not a destination, it's a journey. With that, you leverage survey data from your employees, hopefully qualitative, that's rich, gives us stories, just like the story I just told you, and it impacts. And d and in action, the purpose of this presentation, a part of it is vulnerability. That vulnerability builds trust. That's the Lencioni model, right? Builds trust. It ensures that our employees know that we care and that we are vulnerable too, and that we share experiences. That's what we use to ensure that we take those stories from focus groups, survey data, et cetera, and we leverage it to develop programs and response, activities, processes, all of these things that positively impact that employee at their desk. Now, our next presenter is going to be Stephen Paulstad. Okay. Uh, Stephen is the Senior Sales Manager for Senior Life Publications, a local lifestyle magazine that focuses on adults over 55. Stephen has been an advocate and keynote speaker for LGBTQ rights and inclusiveness for the past 25 years. Please welcome Stephen. Manager, who is our customer? When I'm training my staff, I just say, who are our customers? Well, they're this, they're that, da, da, da. Perfect. Great. Who are we not serving? Huh? Who's not coming through our doors? 
Who's not calling us? Well, this group of people and this type of person. Then that's who we need to focus on. How do we focus on that? We've got to get it into our marketing. We need to train. We need to go out and find these people and tell them what we do to let them know that they're welcome. And if your company's not doing that, you're missing out on a large demographic of people. And there's easy ways of doing that. You don't have to hang a rainbow flag from the roof of your business. You don't have to do that at all. You may not approve of that. That's fine. That's a personal opinion. But in your marketing, in the way you speak to people, in the way you train your employees, it is so important that they're inclusive. So uh, wrapping up our panel presentations, we have Daniela Carion. Uh, Daniela graduated from the University of Central Florida and attended American Washington College of Law, where she received her Juris Doctorate. Uh, <clears throat> Danny worked also for the Center for International Environmental Law and Service Employers International Union. Uh, Danny's work has earned her various awards, and she's a well-regarded author uh, concerning indigenous and immigrant rights. I mean, the most thing is becoming aware that if it would make anybody uncomfortable, you should talk about it with that person. And you should ask them, is this making you uncomfortable? And if, you, if they go, well, okay, well, they, the well is usually yes, so don't do it. You know, it's quite simple. Oftentimes people think that creating a diverse corporation or organization takes a lot of work. To give you an idea, well, no, she's not qualified but she's qualified to lead the diversity and inclusion program? Okay. And so, and then they go, okay, so you think I should have them sit? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, if you value her opinion so much to lead a program, you know, law firm wide, in your nationwide law firm, she should be capable of sitting in in a few of these top level partner meetings or top level partner hires so that she can give that opinion and she can at least give a different thought, okay? It doesn't have to be accepted, but that different thought in itself, welcoming that allows you to say, I have an unconscious bias, but I am becoming aware of it and I'm filling it in by choosing people who I think may think differently than me, who look differently than me, just to at least hear what they have to say. You don't have to agree with them, but you have to hear what they have to say. Now, when people finally get to me, you know you've messed up. You get a letter from me on my letterhead, you know you've messed up. But one of the greatest compliments as an attorney, as a plaintiff side employment lawyer, is when after I sue somebody, a corporation, an organization, they refer someone to me. Or they say, Danny, we wanna talk to you. And I say, I don't represent organizations, this isn't what I do, and they're like, yeah, but obviously you found an issue. You know, how do we address it? And that's how these talks come about because oftentimes organizations don't take the first step until they're sued, okay? So if you're an employee, what does that mean? If you work for someone, what does that mean? That means that even though your company may have those policies set in place where, you know, somebody calls you a name, you go, you report it, you know, maybe they get talked to, then somebody calls you a name again, you go report it, maybe they get shown that policy, then somebody calls you a name again, and then they get fired. And then all of a sudden you stare at your job, you're miserable, you're not performing because now everybody knows that, you know, somebody got fired because of what you reported, and the next thing you know, you're fired. Okay? So then you come to me. Uh, Danny, this question is for you. Okay, all right, time up. Um, Danny, the question's for you. I, I, I deal with a lot of businesses, and you and I spoke briefly on the phone about a situation that I knew about. Could you let the business people know here, if a case makes it all the way through court, what are some of the things that can happen to a business when they're not meeting the requirements of the diversity, and someone sues them and says, you know, this really hurt me a lot. Financially, what, what's your biggest case when it comes to what happened to a company? See, he wants to know how much is it going to cost. Um, uh, okay. So, well, employees in employment cases can seek lost wages as a result of the retaliation or discrimination. They can seek future wages if they've not been able to procure another employment 